There's been lots of debate about the role of society, the legal system and governments in the way women are treated in India. To discuss this, I'm joined on set by Ashwini Tambe, a professor of women's studies at the University of Maryland. And from London, we have Kishwa Desai, an author and columnist who's written a lot about the status of women in India. Thanks to both of you for joining us. Sure. Ashwini, let me start with you. We're hearing of yet an, another case in India where a woman has been hanged. This is right. the fourth case right. in the last few days. Yet we know from news reports that in most instances, these things are not reported. Right. So the problem is a lot bigger than we know, isn't it? Absolutely. And indeed, as a women's studies scholar, I think uh, what's actually been interesting and to some extent troubling has been the focus on sexual violence, when indeed for decades, um, you know, we've been documenting the um, really intolerable rates of violence against women. So we think of sexual violence as one type of violence against women. And uh, it certainly does go underreported. So perhaps what we're seeing right now um, in the past year is an increase in the level of reporting and an increase in attention to it. Uh, but we do have to ask, you know, why is sexual violence in particular taking, uh, grabbing the attention of the public so much? And what does it actually uh, say about our society that we are uh, so fixated on this particular kind of violence? Um, so, yes. Yeah, and also, why is it rising so fast at this time? Kishwa Desai in London, you've written that uh, this type of violence against women has risen tenfold in the past 40 years. What has changed in the past four decades that's caused it to rise so fast? Well, you know, there are two uh, sides to it. Uh, one has been the appalling gender side, which has been taking place in India over the years where a large number of baby girls have gone missing. They've been killed. As you know, uh, there are various figures. Some say even up to 30 million uh, baby girls have been killed one way or the other because it's a society that prefers boys uh, to girls. So on the one hand, you, that has happened. On the other, we have a very young population right now in India, which is completely gender imbalanced, which means that uh, you have far more men in India now than you have women. So naturally, they there is, thanks to that imbalance, a certain amount of frustration, a certain amount of uh, gender um, uh, violence which cre creeps in, which is why you have issues like gang rape and so on coming up. But I also want to say, Anand, that there is one more very major factor which is now taking place, is that there, these young men who are now growing up uh, with very little good family life, where they have any respect for women whatsoever, uh, they are also largely ill-educated and jobless. You know, India is going through uh, what I feel is some kind of a demographic disaster. It was meant to be a dividend, but it isn't. And these young men are increasingly turning towards violence, which could be misogynistic, but which could be also, uh, you know, directed by political parties in any, any direction they want. And that is what you're seeing happening in large parts of the country now. Even, I believe, the rape cases which have recently happened in Uttar Pradesh, they indeed look like there is a political game here going on where these girls are being, you know, publicly hung. There is, there is a, an attention seeking there. And so there is a, something quite horrible going on. Both things are happening at the same time. What do you make, Ashwini, of the government's attitude towards this kind of violence? Um, if I could actually just um, respond to sure. a point Go that ahead. was just made. So, uh, Kishwar, those are really good points about um, the, the landscape of the economic changes in India and uh, the focus on disenfranchised youth, especially those who have migrated to cities. But, you know, I have to be, I have to insert a note of caution because I don't think we really have the data to support that. Um, the claim that mm -hmm. it's young men necessarily who are responsible or that there are increased rates of sexual violence well, uh, by young men because, uh, you know... I just if, want to... If, yeah, uh, yeah, if okay, I can, just, can I just say one thing here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you sure. know, you probably might have heard of uh, one of the most exhaustive surveys on sexual violence that has reported that it's men, uh, you know, the levels of sexual violence, not physical violence, actually increase as you go up the, the economic, I mean, the education and income ladder. So I just want to, you know, uh, uh, caution that we shouldn't be demonizing people who are already dispossessed and, you know, just be uh, asking I, if we have the uh, evidence. Okay, Kishwa, you can respond to that now. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Basically, what has happened is I personally want to just say that I've been tracking this for a while because I have been writing in my last uh, three books. I've exactly written about gang rape and about female feticide and fanticide and other issues to deal with women. So I have been tracking this quite closely. But what uh, one has seen in the public cases uh, which have been discussed of, of gang rape and so on is the profile of the young men who are involved. Because he agreed, there is a lot of rape and domestic violence which right. is going on behind closed doors that we don't know about. Exactly. But the ones, the issues which are coming up in front of us, you look at the profile of those young men and you do begin to understand that these are young men who have been totally marginalized, pushed to the absolute extremes of society and then are being manipulated by the police for criminal acts, often by the politicians also, which is why sometimes these gang rapists, as, as we saw in, a, in the case which, is, which took place in Shakti Mills in Mumbai is it it is not the first time they've done it they've done it over and over again it's only that they got caught because the girl they raped was a photojournalist who complained but many women they had raped before did not complain albeit the police might have known about it and kept quiet because they knew once the complaint went out they knew who the boys were so and even in this case which has recently happened in Uttar Pradesh where these young men were involved the question here is it, it is obviously the neighbors. It, is, it could be a caste uh, factor involved in it as well, where the upper castes are trying to uh, suppress the lower caste. There's also another theory which has been floated, which, is, uh, which we should examine indeed very closely, is whether following uh, the elections just now, there was a message being sent out to certain communities, and please do not vote in this way or in that way. Otherwise, this is what we will do to you, starting with your women. So there, there is a sort of a fierce psychosis also, which is being created by political parties, I think somewhat deliberately, but there is also misogyny, and there is also the manipulation of these young men, which I think is rather sad in okay. today's society. Okay, Ashwini, and that brings us to the attitude of the government, not just the federal government in India, but also the state governments in India mm -hmm. and their attitude towards what is going on right, right now. Is there a recognition that this is a serious problem, a crisis even, that needs to be tackled right now? Right. I think certainly there has been a sense in which this is framed as a crisis. Uh, but what's interesting is that it's often cr framed as a crisis of honor for women or, you know, mm. it's about the problem of not protecting women enough. And that's slightly different in terms of uh, right. the framing uh, mm -hmm. from what feminists have long been calling for, which is for calling for increased access to public public spaces, freedom from fear for women, you know, the right to sexual pleasure for women. So those are very different sets of demands that feminists are making. And certainly you've probably heard about what uh, different state government ministers in the last few days. And interestingly, the Yeah, I'm just looking at it. Right. I mean, one government minister said, yeah, these kinds of incidents happen accidentally. Right. He said, That's sometimes the... it's right, sometimes right. it's wrong. Right. Another right. case where policemen were involved, uh, a minister said, boys will be boys. Right, exactly. So uh, yes, and Mulayam Singh Yadav, um, said the boys will be boys and then it's a BJP state minister um, I think uh, from UP who also and Chhattisgarh who also made that claim about it being accidental and what's interesting is that just yesterday uh, Narendra Modi uh, stepped forward to finally comment on what's going on and it was uh, interesting that his uh, plea is to actually not talk about it. Uh, you know, he's asking people to instead sort of not, you know, he recognizes it might in indeed be a PR disaster to have ministers from the BJP making these sorts of comments. So, yeah, I think it has been uh, some, uh, somewhat troubling when you see people who are given, uh, who have positions of authority uh, uh, really making claims that are quite irresponsible and troubling. Right. Yeah. And Kishwa, to what extent are the police part of the problem here because they are not investigating uh, these attacks, these complaints that they are getting? In many instances, of course, as we've just talked about, police uh, have actually been implicated in some of these attacks right. as well. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and I just want to add uh, a little bit to what Ashwini was asking me earlier about the data and the statistics, that, so then we can come to what the police attitudes are, you know, from there, is that uh, basically, even in a state like Uttar Pradesh, you have 920, uh, 912 women for every 1,000 men. So, you know, you have already quite a divergence in that society, so it becomes a male-dominant. Uh, it is a very patriarchal society already. Uh, 
On top of it, it becomes very male dominant. It's a very aggressive society. And that aggression, thanks to years of co the caste system being so you know, deeply ingrained within where the, where the superiors or automatically suppress anybody who's inferior, so-called inferior to them, gets so ingrained that you know, women who are helpless and already marginalized are often targets. So what happens is that even when you go and complain uh, in the police station, often it is the woman who is targeted. They, there was this case just last year of a 10-year-old girl who was apparently raped, and she was taken to the police station by her family, and they were all locked up. So right. this is the attitude of the police, because they know that they have political patronage. They know they can get away with it. And that is why I fear that somewhere this entire misogynistic aspect is also being uh, manipulated, uh, you know, in a political fashion, and I am very concerned about that because there is a huge amount uh, of rape and, uh, you know, domestic violence and otherwise going on anyway, and now there is a political aspect to it as well. Okay, the other thing, Ashwini, is that there's a very low conviction rate when it comes That's to right. people who have actually been charged, and right. we appear in court, it's something like just a quarter of them right. are actually convicted. India passed a law last year against sexual violence. Um, the which, criminal law amendment. Act, right, yes. uh, in, in the federal government. Mm -hmm. um, does it have enough laws to deal with this that are on the statute books already? What does it need to do? I mean, there are other things which right. need to be addressed as well, like this grotesque practice of acid attacks, where right. acid is thrown on women's right, faces. Right, right. And indeed, that was one kind of violence that was added to the criminal law amendment bill, the acid attacks. So, you know, it's an interesting, um, th that particular legislation is quite interesting because there was a lot of contestation around it. And uh, it certainly has new elements, such as the acid attack. Um, it also mentions stalking, electronic stalking, which is something that is an issue in the United States as well. Um, it also doesn't mention what I think is a really uh, important problem, and that is marital rape. Uh, and that's the point that I was making earlier, that if we look at sexual violence, it doesn't happen just in these highly spectacular and gruesome incidents. It also happens within homes and across socioeconomic um, groups. And often there are higher reports, uh, higher, there's higher reporting in um, the upper uh, classes. Uh, what I think we should ask ourselves is whether we want to think of the state as uh, the protector. And when we place our faith in the law, we're implicitly saying that. And to my mind, I'm not sure given the uh, sort of infrastructure of enforcement, which is quite poor in India, uh, whether that is necessarily where we should be placing all our energy. And I've actually been much more uh, inspired. So what's, what's the alternative? Right, right. I've been actually much more inspired uh, by a lot of different kinds of campaigns around women's access to public spaces. You know, there's the Freedom From Fear platform. There are movements such as Blank Noise that go back several years, even before these uh, incidents. Uh, you know, there are also campaigns to engage men, because, you know, this is really a, it's it's framed as a women's issue, but the problem really is men's attitudes. So there have been creative public uh, um, uh, sort of service announcements. And, and you can't legislate against that. Can you, you can't. In fact, you really need to shift people, men's sense of entitlement, right? When you think right. about marital rape, it's men's sense of entitlement that they should expect sex from their wives or girlfriends regardless of whether or not she's willing. And you know, shift, and framing it in terms of women's claims to pleasure and their desires is, I think, the kind of shift that we really need to um, see. And that's not something states can um, Yeah, Let me get Kishore's view on that. Yeah. Uh, should the lead, Kishore, come from the government right now? There's a new government in place in India. They've just taken office. Should we see more uh, attention being paid to this? Uh, well, I'm afraid in a, in a country like India, the lead has to come from the government. You know, what much though we would all like to see uh, society changing rapidly, but there will have to be certain steps that the government takes. And these are, of course, well known already. Ashwini's already outlined quite a few in terms of the new law and things like that. But, you know, according to, to me, certainly, laws are not the only way. We need to see a more equitable um, uh, distribution of everything. A right from health to education to jobs uh, to see more women in the workplace and this is where the government has to take a stand it has to take a stand it has to pass the 33 uh, percent reservation for women in parliament it should do those things because it is only through those very public pronouncements and uh, showing that they are on the side of the women of today that this government will be looked upon as a modern government I was very cheered by the fact that you know 25 percent of the new cabinet 
cabinet comprises of women. Now, this is something which they must do more and more, and we need to see more and more of. Because it's only when women are seen to be working, going out to be economically productive, alas, that is the one measure that most people recognize, is then they will be valued for what they give back to society. They give back enough as it is, but I'm afraid there has to be an economic value to it. And that is where the government support comes in. And I also do believe there is a lot to be done still in terms of policing, in getting more women into the police force, in also ensuring. Uh, recently, they announced that there was going to be uh, some, you know, particular rape uh, uh, sort of, you know, places where women could register rape and so right. on, where they would be looked after. I think those spaces have to be created also. So I think those pronouncements are very healthy. We must encourage them, and we must hope from this new government that something will happen. Okay, and that's where we have to leave it, I'm afraid. We've run out of time. That's it for this edition of The Heat. We'd love to hear from you, so please send us your questions, comments, and story ideas to theheat at cctv-america.com. And now you can listen to CCTV America programs 24-7 from anywhere in the United States by simply calling 231-460-1199. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.